الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا أما بعد Last week we had discussed um, the beginnings of the prophetic da'wah and some of the early converts who went into a long detailed tangent of Nabi and Rasul which inshallah was beneficial and useful and we decided and we clarified the meaning of Nabi and Rasul and we said that our Prophet was both a Nabi and a Rasul. Now one point that we mentioned in passing last week and now we're going to continue inshallah with this week is that this da'wah was a, uh, a lot of people call it a secret da'wah, but this is not a good word to use. The better word to use, it was a private da'wah. What is the difference between secret and private? Secret means nobody knew about it. Private means you kept it to yourself, but people, it was an open secret. Our Prophet did not do secret da'wah. His da'wah, when he started preaching Islam, rumors spread that he was preaching a new theology. The people heard about it. And this is proven in the story of Amr ibn Abbasah who was in Yemen. We said, we said his story last week. That he came from Yemen because rumors had reached him that a new prophet or a new message was being preached. And he's in Yemen. And when he goes all the way to Mecca, the Prophet says, don't accept Islam now. It's too early. And this shows that at this time, the Prophet was not preaching to anybody outside of Mecca because he went in stages. Initially, the, the preaching is only to the people in Mecca. So much so that when Amr comes, the Prophet says, not now, later. Go back to your country. When you hear that I have become victorious, then come back to me. Now, this is very important because it shows that even in this stage, the Prophet's da'wah was known, but he didn't make it public. It was private. What does it mean private? He went to his friends. He went to those whom he trusted. He did not go stand up in public and say, Oh Quraysh, I am a prophet of Allah. And because he didn't go public, there could be no public opposition. How can you oppose him? He's not doing anything public. And therefore, for three years, some reports say four, but the proper, uh, correct opinion, inshallah, for three years, the first three years of the da'wah, the Prophet ﷺ did not preach to the masses. He didn't preach to the pilgrims. He didn't preach to the visitors of Mecca. He didn't preach even to his own relatives whom he thought would not accept Islam. So Abu Lahab, for example, was not approached. Abu Lahab was not approached. His distant relatives, Abu Jahl and others, were not approached. Because he has a feeling that these people will mock him and ridicule him. Not now. So for three years, the da'wah is private. Abu Lahab hears, Abu Jahl hears, but what can they do? Because he's not doing anything to them. He's not interfering with the trade of Mecca. He's not standing in front of the Kaaba saying anything, so they don't do anything to him. And therefore, in these three years, the da'wah of the Prophet ﷺ did not face any public opposition. And in this, of course, is the whole point in wisdom. Why, for three years, was the da'wah private? Many reasons. First and for foremost, because this private da'wah did not result in any confrontation between the Muslims and the Quraysh. No torture, no ridicule, nothing. Why? Because there's no threat. Because things are undercover. If somebody converts to Islam, he's not making a public announcement. He's simply minding his own business and not getting involved with his society at a religious level. And therefore, for these first three years, there's no ridicule, no torture, no adab, nothing. For these three years, the Muslims uh, are being taught their religion without any persecution. They need to know their faith. They're concentrating on the teachings of Islam. They're not worried about the torture, the politics. In fact, this is what prepared them to face the torture later on. This is what gave them the spiritual boost they needed to be prepared for what was happening later on. And this also shows that in some circumstances, it is permissible to give da'wah in private. If the political climate is one of fear, if the political climate is one of tension, then you don't have to go public about your da'wah. Now, what is the difference between private and secret? We are not secretive. But you don't have to stand in front of everybody and proclaim uh, the message of Islam. For, for an example, uh, in communist Russia in the 90s, in the 80s, in the 70s, right? In uh, places in China, there's still religious persecution. Alhamdulillah, in America, we don't have this. But in many lands, if you proclaim you are something other than the official faith, you will be persecuted, right? And there are many cases in the 20s and 30s, especially when communism took over, that they would literally kill people for claiming to be Muslim. Our religion does not demand that we do this. Stay private then. Keep a low key. 
You don't have to cause interference. Just mind your own business, give your own da'wah. If somebody comes, now you cannot hide the truth. He wants to know what is Islam. He's a potential convert. You cannot hide the truth. You preach to them what is Islam. But you don't have to go public if there is a fear of persecution. Also notice, we already said this last week, notice that every single convert in this stage becomes a leader, becomes a mover and shaker. Unlike some of the later converts, we don't even know the names of most of the Sahaba, by the way, right? The Sahaba are more than 100,000. More than 100,000. Of those, we only have the names of around 5,000. That's it. So the bulk of the Sahaba, we don't even know their names. Why? Because they just performed a hajj with the Prophet ﷺ. They went in one ghazwa and that's it. So their names are not recorded. The names of those that are recorded are few. And of those, the bulk of them, we only have one or two incidents. It is really a f only a handful, 20, 30, 40, 100 or so, that we have life stories about, right? And each and every one of these, most of them were the early converts or of the Ansar, the early Ansar. And this shows that Every single person who converted at this early stage, their iman was so powerful that they went on to play a significant role in early Islam. Also notice that in the first three years, apart from the six or seven that I mentioned last week, Abu Bakr and uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, Uthman, Zubair, Abd uh, Rahman ibn Auf, apart from those few, the bulk of the converts were actually from the lower class. There were a few that were from the elite, and I mentioned their names, Abu Bakr, and uh, you can even say Zayd ibn Haritha because he was adopted by the Prophet so his lineage, even though it was not Qurashi, he was considered of the elite because he was adopted, quote-unquote, Zayd ibn Muhammad, they called him. But these were six or seven. The bulk of the Sahaba, personified by Ammar ibn Yasir and Yasir and Sumayyah and Abdurrahman ibn Auf and of course Bilal uh, and uh, uh, Abdurrahman ibn Khabab ibn Arat uh, Khab all of these of the uh, Sahaba were of the lower class and this is the general rule it is so much of a general rule that Heraclius the Emperor of Rome the first time the Prophet wrote him a letter he wanted to find out what is this religion so he quizzed Abu Sufyan, 10 questions, which I went over, I think, uh, in the past, and which I will go over it again. One of those questions, who are his converts? Are they the rich and powerful, or are the, they the weak and the downtrodden? And Abu Sufyan said, well, the bulk of his converts are the weak and the lower class. And Heraclius explained, and he said, this is the sign of a true faith. That the first people who accept it are the weak and the lower class. Because it doesn't appeal to the rich. It doesn't appeal to the oligarchs. It doesn't appeal to the elite. Because they're going to have to give up their privileges. They're going to have to give up their status. Whereas the poor, this is a message that they accept and understand because they know it is the truth. And also because when you're rich and powerful, you have more to lose when you change status quo. Right? When you're rich and powerful, you want things to remain as they are. Whereas when you're weak and you're disenfranchised, then it is easier to see the truth. You don't have that much to lose. And of course Allah mentions this in the Quran uh, that even the earliest prophets the people of Hud they said we only find your followers to be the Bedouins or the people who take care of the sheep. This is the, your followers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions even the people of Musa, the Jews of Bani Israel, they were persecuted in Egypt and they were the lower class of Egypt. But in the beginning they're the lower class and in the end they always end up to be the victors. As Allah says, وَأَوْرَثْنَا الْقَوْمَ الَّذِينَ كَانُوا يُسْتَضْعَفُونَ مَشَارِقَ عَرْضِ وَمَغَارِبَ الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا That the people who were persecuted, the Bani Israel in this case, eventually they became the leaders and they inherited the land even though they were the ones who were persecuted before. So in this early stage of da'wah, what was the wisdom? Once again, no persecution, make iman strong, allow the brotherhood to form, each and every one of these converts becomes a role model and many other blessings along with that. Uh, as we already, already mentioned, it seems, there's no authentic narration, but it seems that at this early stage, salah and wudu were legislated. And this is something that even logically makes sense. That from the very beginning, there was salah and there was wudu. Jibreel came down and he taught the Prophet ﷺ how to do wudu. And he taught him uh, how to pray. And at this stage, prayer was voluntary, not obligatory. 
And it was made obligatory in Isra wal Mi'raj. And that's why when Allah told him to pray, he didn't need to be taught how to pray, because he already knew how to pray. When Allah told him you have to pray five times a day, he didn't need to be taught at that stage. But at that stage it became legislated. Also, at, in this early stage, prayer was only two rak'at. There were no three rak'at or four rak'at. All of the prayers were two rak'at. And this is what Aisha says in a hadith in Sahih Bukhari. So, to summarize before we move on, and this is an interesting summary, uh, uh, that you should memorize or write down the stages of da'wah of the Prophet ﷺ. The stages of da'wah. The stages of da'wah are five. The stages of da'wah are five. And each of these stages is a legitimate stage for any Muslim community in the world depending on their circumstance. However we are, we choose which stage to be. The first stage is the private da'wah. The private da'wah means you don't have to confront the public. Let the public status quo remain. You're too weak or the political climate is too difficult, private da'wah means you don't have to become a martyr. In our religion, it's a very pragmatic religion. It's a very realistic religion. You don't have to go kill yourself if you're not going to gain anything. If the community is going to kill you, persecute you, just be a Muslim in your private life. Private da'wah. The Prophet did it for three years. The second stage, the second stage of da'wah, public da'wah with no military Commandments. It's just preaching with the tongue. And this was the bulk of the Prophet's life, 10 or 11 years of Mecca. Preaching with the tongue and no military confrontation. And even if they kill you, you can't do anything back. Because now is you're not capable of doing anything. You just have to bear in patience. And these are the commandments of patience in the Qur'an. The commandment of if they do something, turn away, leave the jahileen, don't engage with them. You just give your da'wah. And this was 10 years of da'wah. And of these 10, the last 6 or 7 were extremely difficult. To the extent of multiple assassination attempts, as we're going to talk about inshallah today and next few weeks inshallah ta'ala. The first 3-4 years were difficult, but then they became even more and more difficult and this led to the immigration to Abyssinia, this led to Ta'if, this led to the year of sorrow, this led to the boycott, all of this inshallah we will discuss. Throughout all of these 10 years, no physical confrontation. Even if they kill one of yours, there's nothing you can do, you don't kill back one of theirs. And this is the peaceful da'wah through the tongue. That's the second stage. The third stage, da'wah with the tongue along with physical fighting, to one group only, or to a particular group. And this happened for the first six years after the Hijrah. That the Muslims fought only the Quraysh of Mecca. They did not fight any other tribe. Because the other tribes had nothing to do with them. And so the Muslims had military battles only with the Quraysh, or if anybody allied with the Quraysh and attacked them, then of course the Muslims had to attack back. Right. So this is the third stage of da'wah. Open da'wah along with military confrontation to a specific enemy. The fourth stage of da'wah was open da'wah to all with izzah. Unlike when they were in Mecca, they couldn't do anything. But the, the fourth stage, you attack if only you need to in defense. Whereas in the Meccan stage, you didn't even attack because, meaning you didn't have any type of attack against them, retaliatory attack. If somebody kills one of yours, there's nothing you can do back because you are persecuted. The fourth stage, you have political power, but you don't utilize it for military uh, accomplishments, for military endeavors, unless you do so for defense. And this happened in the Medinan stage after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah until the conquest of Mecca. What was the Treaty of Hudaybiyah? Remember the condition. One of the conditions was no fighting. And the Prophet said, okay, no fighting. So there was no fighting even though he had the power. And he had the army. And he had the resources. But the political climate dictated no fighting and that was what was best. So they said, fine, no fighting. And we'll talk about that when we get there. That was one of the biggest victories of Islam. No fighting. And Allah revealed, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. We've given you the biggest victory. And Umar didn't understand. We'll cut to that later. He said, how is this a victory? We have lost. How is this a victory? And Allah told him, this is a victory. And he, they saw with their own eyes and we're going to come to that later on. And the fifth and final stage was 
open da'wah along with physical confrontation to anybody who opposes Islam. And this was the stage that the Prophet ﷺ passed away upon. That he was sending out not only delegations but armies. He was sending, uh, he was sending Usama ibn Zayd right, to uh, the Romans. He was sending all these armies. And the Sahaba continued along the fifth stage. And that is why they conquered Persia. And they conquered most of the Roman Empire. They took over Damascus and Syria and, and Palestine and Egypt and North Africa. And the Umayyad continued this and they conquered Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and Afghanistan. And they conquered what is now Pakistan and parts of India. And they went all the way to China. And then finally in the mid stage of the Abbasids, they decided to go back to the fourth stage. And that is open da'wah to all and stop the fighting. Stop the fighting unless there's a need to. And for the bulk of the Ummah, when we had a Khilaf, we no longer have one. For the bulk of the Ummah, the Ummah was upon basically the fourth stage, which is open da'wah to all, and we only fight if there's a need to. And this clearly shows that military conquest is not a part of Islam. It is a possible part that the Ummah utilized when it wanted to and when it needed to. The main thing is to preach the message. And you utilize what is the best way possible. And historically speaking, our ummah has utilized all of these ways. And therefore, in our times, there's no question that militarily, this is not any time we can do anything, especially as minorities in many lands. This is the time we talk about public da'wah without any confrontation, where we preach our message and those groups that are violent, those groups that are talking about these things, we say, no, this is not the way of our religion. Our Prophet ﷺ showed us the clear way. And his methodology is the best methodology and his seerah is the best seerah. So these are the five stages of da'wah that the Prophet ﷺ underwent and every community throughout the world, its leaders, its ulama can see which of these five is best for that community. Which of these five is the best for that community and each of these is a legitimate means of our Prophet ﷺ. So we now move on to the second stage of those five stages of da'wah and that is open preaching without any Conflict, open, without any military, of course there's conflict, there's going to be persecution, but without any public conflict from, from the Prophet's sides. Open preaching without any command for warfare. This open preaching, it took place three years after Iqra came down. And Allah revealed a number of verses to command him to preach publicly. Two of them are the most important. Two of them were the ones that the Prophet ﷺ realized this means I need to go public. The first of these is Surah Al-Hijr verse 94. Surah Al-Hijr verse 94. Where Allah says, فَاصْدَعْ بِمَا تُؤْمَرُ وَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْمُشْرِكِ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ فَاصْدَعْ بِمَا تُؤْمَرُ Isda' means to publicly proclaim. It means to come forth and be clear. Don't hide anymore. Don't be private. Go forth brazenly and proclaim bima tu'mar, what we have commanded you to. Wa'arid anil jahilin and turn away from the ignorant people. Ignore what they're going to do to you. So the Prophet understood this is a command to go public. And then a verse came down which was even more explicit. And this is the commonly verse, uh, the verse that is commonly associated with the public da'wah. That is Surah al shuara verse 214. Surah al shuara verse 214. Where Allah says, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ And warn your close relatives. Warn your close family. And Ashira here, of course, it applies not only to his uncles and aunts, it applies to the Quraysh because that is his Ashira. His Ashira, the Quraysh, all of the people of Mecca are his tribe. Warn your fellow tribesmen, basically. right? And Ashira doesn't just mean family, it means your kith and kin, and that basically means the tribe. So when this verse came down, the Prophet realized that he needed to go public. Now, looking at uh, the source books of Sirah, it appears that he did this in two stages. The first stage, he went public to the Banu Hashim only. That is his immediate tribe. Remember, and this is something we we'll go back to lineage and ilm al-ansab or nasab. Remember, I've said this many times, the people of Mecca were all one tribe, the Quraysh. And within the Quraysh, there were at least six or seven major tribes. 
Of them are the Banu Hashim, of them are the Banu Maghzum, of them are the Banu Abd al and all of these different sub-tribes, right? And uh, the Banu Umayyah, all of these different sub-tribes are of course related by great-great-grandfather, three or four or five generations. None of them go back more than that, right? Four or five generations back, all of them come to the same lineage. So all of them know each other's nasab and lineage, they've memorized it. They know each other exactly how each one is related. So the Prophet ﷺ first invited his immediate tribe, and that is the, the, the sons of Hashim and Abdi Manaf. And this is, of course, his immediate uncles and aunts, his immediate uh, uh, Banu of, of the, the Banu Hashim, we call it. And he invited them, it is said, to his own house. And he told Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was at that time a young boy, he told him to prepare a little bit of food and uh, broth, some soup, and a little bit of, of, of food. And they didn't have that much, they only had one leg of lamb. But he invited over 40 of their adults. Over 40 of the adults came, and the Prophet ﷺ was the first to eat, and he blessed it. And the, the, the reporter, or the, the narrator says, that even though the food was in one plate, all 40 of them ate to their fill, as if they ate the entire plate themselves. This is one of the first miracles that is happening. And they drank from this soup that was in one cup, as if this was their only cup, and they all drank from it to their fill. And Abu Lahab sensed that something was going to happen. So Abu Lahab was scared that the Prophet ﷺ would make public what was now private. So before they finished eating, he stood up and he gave an excuse and he said he needs to go back and he will basically adjourn the meeting or not even a meeting, he has to go home. And of course Abu Lahab is one of the seniors, he's one of the elders and he is an immediate uncle. So when he leaves, it kind of destroys the uh, aura that was being created that something is going to happen now. And so when he gave an excuse, a number of others gave an excuse and they left. The Prophet understood that this was a tactic of Abu Lahab. A few days later he did the same thing. He told Ali to make another meal, he cooked it, and he invited them again. This time before they could finish, he stood up and he began preaching. And he began by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and giving what we call khutbatul haja in alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu and this khutbah was never heard of by the arabs before it was something that our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah inspired him to do and then he said o oh, bani abdul muttalib o oh, my fellow tribesmen i do not know of any arab before me who is coming to his people with a message that is better than what i am coming to you with I'm coming to you with something that will give you your deen and your dunya, this world and the akhirah. I'm coming to you as a messenger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if you leave your idolatry and you turn to Him, then Allah will give you all the good of this world and give you the Jannah in the next. And he went on preaching and preaching and this was the first time that the message of Islam publicly or openly reached many of their ears. Before this time, Abu Lahab is hearing rumors, but he's never heard his nephew preach. Before this time, other people have heard that their, their nephew or the Prophet is preaching, but they have not been approached directly. So this was the first time that this message was uh, reaching them. And Abu Lahab became irritated at this, and he said to the Prophet ﷺ, he said to the people around the Prophet, he did not even address the Prophet ﷺ, he said to the people around the Prophet ﷺ that this seems to be an unworthy message. We have our ways and with the ways of our forefathers and who does this young man think he is to come and oppose the ways of our forefathers? And he was the only one who was harsh. The rest of his uncles and aunts took the message not that seriously, they had heard about it, and Ali, it is said in, in one of the uh, source books, Ali stood up and said, O Messenger of Allah, I will help you. And he was the youngest of all of them, and this is not surprising if this is true, uh, and, it, uh, and, and there's no surprise in Ali radiallahu anhu being this brave. So at this point, the people, his immediate relatives did not accept, nor did they reject, because again, this is a private gathering, it's in the, his, the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and the only one who publicly expressed some irritation was Abu Lahab. Few days later, or a few weeks later, again we don't have an exact chronology, but soon after this, this is when the Prophet went public to the whole city. Now he went public to the whole city of 
Mecca. And this report is reported in Bukhari, and it is mentioned here is the famous story that all of you know, that the Prophet ﷺ climbed the mountain of Safa. Now, the mountain of Safa is the closest mountain to the Kaaba, as you know, right? And it was in fact much taller than it is right now. Right now you can say it's probably gone down one third of what it used to be. When people go up and down, every time somebody goes up and down, some minuscule amount gets eroded away. This is just basic geology, basic uh, uh, knowledge, you know. So if you go up and down, up and down, the mountain is going to get eroded away. And so over the course of the last 14 centuries, Safa has gone down much more than it used to be. So for a person in Mecca to climb to the top of Safa, this was their equivalent of I have a message to tell you. Nobody climbed to the top of Safa unless there's an announcement to make. And this is well known. So the Prophet ﷺ climbed on the mountain of Safa and he began calling the people. Now, you have to realize Mecca was a how, uh, probably had a thousand people in it. That's it. Small little village. And one voice crying from the top of the mountain of Safa is enough to tell the people something is going on. So when the Prophet ﷺ is calling, O oh, Bani Abd dar O oh, Bani Abd Manaf, Oh, Bani Hashim. This is something, this is basically a town hall meeting, as we would say in old America, maybe like that, right? Everybody has to come. No, this is not something that is done except for a major event. So people stop doing what they're doing. And they come and they listen because this is how you get the news across. And they waited for everybody to assemble. And then the Prophet ﷺ gave that famous speech that all of us know. And he said, if I were to inform you, Oh, he, be, he gave them the basic question, what do you know from me? How do you trust me? And they said, we know nothing but good from you. You are our son and the son of our brother. You are our nephew and the son of our uh, one that we know. Have you heard any lie from me? We have heard nothing but good. You are Al-Ameen. And then he said, if I were to tell you that there is an army attacking, because again, he's standing on one side of Mecca and he can see what they cannot see. So he says, hypothetically, if I were to tell you I can see an army, would you believe me? Meaning, would you take action right now? Am I that trustworthy that if I were to tell you that I see an army right now, would you take action and become panicked and, 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 and go and prepare yourselves? And this is something that otherwise you would require, you would go verify, you would, you would go and check. But do you trust me that much that without any verification, just with my word, you will listen to me that there's an army? And they said, Ajal, yes. Ma jarrabna alayk al -kathir. We never heard you ever say a lie. We never heard you say a lie. And so here is when the Prophet ﷺ said, Then know therefore, know therefore that I am a warner sent by Allah to proclaim the coming of a severe punishment on the day of judgment unless you turn to him and leave your idolatry. O oh, Bani Ka'b ibn, uh, ibn Lu'ay, save yourselves from the fire of hell, I will not be able to help you. O oh, Bani Murrah ibn Ka'b, save yourselves from the fire of hell, O oh, Bani Abd Manaf, O oh, Bani Abdul Muttalib, and he began with the furthest tribe that was related to him, and he worked his way inward, closer and closer, until he got to the Banu Hashim, and then he began mentioning his uncles by name. O oh, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, O oh, Safiya, Binti Abdul Muttalib, and in one version, O Safiya, the aunt of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he concluded with the person who was the most dear and the most beloved to him. And he said, O Fatima binti Muhammad. And every time he mentioned a name, the same phrase is said. You need to save yourself from the fire of hell. I cannot help you at all. This is my message to you. You need to change your lifestyles. And you need to think about the hereafter, because I'm not going to benefit you. And then with Fatima, he added one phrase that he didn't add for anybody else. And that was, O oh, Fatima binti Abdul Muttalib, I, uh, save yourself from fire hell. I cannot save uh, you, uh, you on the day of judgment, except that from this world, I will give you all that I have. If you, you're, I'm your father, you ask me anything that I have, it is yours. But in the hereafter, I cannot save you from Allah's punishment. So when he finished this message, and it was, it was an inspiring, it was an emotional message, it was very emotional. He's telling his people uh, that they need to save themselves, change their lifestyles. This is when the infamous incident happened, where Abu Lahab stood up, and he took up some stand, sand and he threw it. And this is meant to show 
uh, vulgarity to show what is this? It's worth not even worth my sand. It's not even worth this this sand that I'm throwing. And this is a sign of arrogance to throw sand at somebody. And he stood up and he threw it in the direction of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, billah, ya Muhammad, ali hadha da'utana." That tabbalak means may you be cursed, uh, oh, uh, oh Muhammad. And I think Allah was referring to simply saying this, but this I'm narrating what uh, Abu Lahab said that may you be cursed. Is this why you called us here? You wanted us to leave our whatever we were doing and you called us here in order to do this? And this is when of course Allah revealed in the Quran Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma kasab sayasla naran dhat lahab wa mra'atuhu hammalat al hatab fi jidiha hablum mim masad. And that is a tafsir of the surah, uh, Surah Al Lahab that deserves its own time and place. Abu Lahab was the one, the first. The first person to publicly oppose the message and to publicly ridicule the message was Abu Lahab. And he went a degree more than what he did a few days ago. And this he's trying to show his quote unquote bravery and manhood. That in, in private, in, his, in the house of the Prophet he was not that rude. He was not that vulgar. But now in public he needs to put on this false sense of courage, this false sense of bravado if you like. This is his own nephew. And so he needs to show how much he's opposed to it. And it was because of this arrogance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded back in that kind. And this is of course the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that never has a messenger been sent except that he had to face a struggle against his own people. Most of mankind, most of mankind do not want to change their lifestyles. It's difficult to give up what you're used to. It's difficult to lead a religious life. And therefore, even the Prophet ﷺ themselves, when they come, their own families and their own peoples reject them. And this has been the sunnah of Allah from the very beginning of time. Of the benefits we gain here is that Every single person needs to be responsible first and foremost for his immediate family and then for society at large. Because Allah Azza wa Jal revealed, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ Before He revealed verses that proclaim the message to all of mankind. And we'll get to those verses in a while. Initially, the Prophet is told, preach to your relatives. So much so that when a Yemeni comes to him, he tells him, not now, go back, later on. Not now. Because the message, the message is not for now. The message for you is for later on. So, the responsibility of the da'i for immediate family is much more than for anyone else. And therefore the Prophet first called Banu Hashim. And then he made the public call to Mecca. And then a few years later, he made the public call to all of humanity. From this point onwards, the Prophet ﷺ started preaching everywhere, in public venues, in front of the Kaaba. When the Hujjaj came, when visitors came to Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ would be waiting for them outside of Mecca. And when the visitors came, or when the Hujjaj came, he would speak to them in the marketplaces of Mina. This is when the Prophet ﷺ's da'wah became public. And of course, this is when the public opposition began as well. How did they oppose the message? By many ways. And inshallah today we'll summarize eight or nine of these ways that they oppose the message. Uh, and realize that what I'm mentioning today is not necessarily chronological. I'm simply summarizing how did uh, these uh, Qurayshis and, and people of Mecca oppose the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his da'wah. What did they do to try to prevent him? Number one, the first thing that they did is they tried to appeal to the highest authority of Mecca and that is Abu Talib. Now, you have to realize how did the people of Mecca live in terms of political laws? There was no one ruler out of all of Mecca. They didn't have a king. They were too arrogant to appoint one person, right? And by the way, one of the signs of a civilized society is to have one ruler. This is one of the signs of a truly civilized society, right? That they have one person in charge. You need to have somebody in the top. And when you don't have that civilized society, you have a little bit of chaos, then you don't have one ruler. The people of Mecca did not have one ruler. That was too much for them. What, did they, what they did have was a Darun Nadwa. And that was a group of senior people, none of whom was actually in charge, but they had a say in the matter. 
Who are the people in this Darun Nadwa? Who are the people in this uh, circle of, let's say, we cannot call it senators because there's no president, but you get my point. There's a group of people who are the main leaders. They are the representatives of each of the tribes. So each of the sub-tribes has a ruler. The Banu Hashim has a ruler. The Banu Makhzum has a ruler. The Banu Abd Manaf or the Banu uh, 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 Kilab al Murad, they have a ruler. Each of the sub-tribes has Call it a chief, but it's not the chief of the Quraysh. It's the chief of that one tribe. And the affairs of that one tribe will be in accordance with what the chieftain says. So the, the chief of, or the leader of the Banu Hashim was of course Abu Talib. The leader of the Banu Hashim was Abu Talib. And it was of the ways of the Arabs that the leader of the tribe is never deposed. He's never gotten rid of, he's never uh, uh, disobeyed, he's given the utmost respect, and then one of his children after him takes over that leadership. And that's why when Abdul Muttalib died, then Abu Talib took charge because he was the most respected of the sons of Abdul Muttalib. And so Abu Talib took on this leadership. So when the Prophet started preaching, the first thing they do, they appeal to Abu Talib. And they went to him gently and they said, O oh Abu Talib, this is your nephew cursing our idols, preaching a message that is different than our forefathers. Surely you cannot let this happen. And Abu Talib tried to basically stall them. And he did not want a confrontation. And we don't know exactly what he says. The riwayah says that he said to them, He gave them some gentle words and he had them go their way. Perhaps he promised them, perhaps he did something, but he didn't take a stand, either for or against. He simply sidetracked, hoping that the matter would go away. Well, it didn't go away. A few weeks later, they come to Abu Talib again. And as more and more people are converting, as more and more of the hujjaj go back bearing the news that there is a man in Mecca preaching a new message, they realize that action has to be taken. And so they increase the pressure on Abu Talib. The first thing that they do is they try to threaten him. They try to bribe him. They try to cajole him. They say to him, we cannot take this anymore. Your nephew is insulting our forefathers. Now, subhanAllah, this is the way of everybody who opposes Islam. Look at the modern Islamophobes. They take a small thing and they make it so big as if the world is going to collapse, right? Look at their fear of the shariatization of America and how ridiculous. Wallahi, the Prophet ﷺ did not curse their forefathers. It's his own forefathers, right? But what is he saying? Tawheed. So they take one plus one and they make 20 out of it. He's preaching Tawheed and he's saying idolatry is not a good way, it's foolish. Now, they of course say, well if it's foolish, this means our forefathers were foolish. And if they're foolish, this means you're cursing them. And if you're cursing them, this means this. And so they make this statement, which is true, and they make it into such a big deal. And they come back exaggerated 20 times. And they say, your nephew is doing this and he's doing that. And he's cursing our idols. The Prophet never cursed their idols. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَسُبُّ الَّذِينَ دِعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّ اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ Do not curse their false idols. There's a verse in the Quran. And yet they accused him of cursing their idols. Right? Again, this is how, this is what happens when you're full of hatred. Doesn't matter what you do, they'll take one plus one, they'll make 20 out of it. Okay? So they go back to Abu Talib and they say, your nephew is cursing our idols. He's ridiculing our forefathers. Again, he didn't ridicule the forefathers, but he is saying idolatry is foolish. Take it or leave it. What your forefathers were, I'm not, I'm saying idolatry is foolish, right? And again, they take it and they take it 10 different steps. And so they say, we cannot bear this anymore. You either stop him from preaching yourself or you hand him over to us and we do as we please. One of the two, we give you two options. You either stop him yourself or you hand him over to us. And Abu Talib had never been confronted by his people in this manner. Now realize that every leader, wallahi, every leader is outwardly powerful, inwardly very weak. Because every leader is dependent upon the people that follow him for that leadership. And that is why every leader has to appease his own, his own followers. You cannot be a leader without appeasing your followers. You cannot be. Even if you're a tyrant, even if you're a tyrant, you need to have a core group 
whom you appease and who execute your tyrannical policies, even if you're a mass murderer as a leader, you need to have a core you can trust. And that core, you give them everything that they want. And you'll overlook any crime that they do. Or else you cannot be a leader. It is only Allah Azza wa Jal who is truly Al-Malik. Everybody else is not really a true king because they are not powerful. They're dependent on the people around them. They need to have viziers, they need to have ministers, they need to have army. So when your own people oppose you completely, you, are, you don't have any power. And Abu Talib had never been opposed in this manner. That every single member of the tribe is coming and saying, you have one of two options. You stop him, or else if you don't have the guts, give him over to us. What do you mean give him over to us? Once again, you need to understand the way of the Arabs. They could not harm one of their own tribe's men unless the chief of the tribe allows this. This is the law of the Arabs. And if they were to disobey it, they would face shame and ridicule. Never before had a tribe killed one of its own members with impunity. This is, uh, you have to understand the gang mentality. If you're on our side, you're on our blood, then that's it. Doesn't matter what you do. If you commit a crime, we will deal with you internally. We're going to deal. How do we deal with you? The chief or the, the, the leader has to decide. So as long as Abu Talib did not hand over the Prophet ﷺ, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't touch a hair on his head. Because it would cause them shame. Because they went against their own tribal laws. So they go to Abu Talib and they demand one of two things. Never had Abu Talib been confronted with such hostility from his own Banu Hashim. And so this is when he went to the Prophet ﷺ, the famous story, all of you know it. And he called his nephew, the Prophet ﷺ, and he said to him, Oh my nephew, my people have come to me and they have said such and such. So be merciful to you and be merciful to me. Emotional blackmail here, right? Be merciful to you and be, have some mercy on me. I'm an old man now. Have some mercy on me. And do not place me in a situation that I cannot bear. You're making me do something, I cannot have it. This is emotional blackmail at its best. Because he's not threatening the Prophet ﷺ. He's saying, look at me. I'm an old man. My own people are doing this to me. Have some mercy on me. How much do you expect me to bear? And this is one of the most difficult and traumatic encounters of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Talib loved the Prophet ﷺ more than he loved his own children. And it was the son of his own full brother, Abdullah. And he dealt with him more than how a father could deal with his own son. And the Prophet ﷺ also had that same type of love that he would have for his own father. And this was his full uncle. And here's Abu Talib begging and pleading with him. That have some mercy on an old man. How much do you expect me to bear now? Stop. What else do you want me to do? And here is when the Prophet ﷺ himself became overwhelmed with emotion. And he said that famous statement that, Oh my uncle, Wallahi, if they were to give me the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, Wallahi, I could not give up this message until I succeed in what I'm doing or I die a death in this path preaching what I am preaching. And in another version, which is probably more authentic than this one, he said to his uncle, Do you see the sun, O oh my uncle? And his uncle said, Yes. So he said, Wallahi, I have no more power to stop preaching than you do to light your stick from the sun. He has a stick in his hand, right? To light your stick with this sun. You cannot do that similarly. I cannot do this as well. What is the symbolism here of the phrase here? It, the meaning here, there's, there's a dual meaning here. The first is that the light that I have, the light of Islam, it is brighter than the light of the sun and moon. I cannot extinguish it. If they were to give me all of this light, I have a light that is brighter than this light. I cannot eclipse it. Nothing can eclipse this light. And then, and then of course there's a symbolism here. Even if they were to give me something that is beyond this world. Forget money, forget wealth, forget fame. Even if they were to give me something beyond this world, the sun and the moon, I could not give up what I am doing until I meet my death or I succeed in my message. And when Abu Talib saw this persistence, he saw in the eyes of the Prophet ﷺ that passion, that sincerity, he said to him, 
Do what you will, my nephew, for wallahi, I will never come to you again to stop what you're doing. And he lived up to his word, no matter what the Quraysh did, no matter what they did, he never once came back to reprimand his nephew. Why did you do this? Why did I have to do that? Even when he had to go and sacrifice his own livelihood and live a life of misery and poverty in the boycott, as we're going to come to next week, when he couldn't even live in Mecca, he was the only non-Muslim who actually went and lived with the Muslims in the boycott of the Sha'b of the of the valley as we'll talk about without even living a normal life because he told his nephew a promise he said I'm never gonna approach you again about stopping you do as you please you have my protection even this did not satisfy the Quraysh when they heard of this that he tried and he failed they then came to him again a complete delegation of the Quraysh and not just the Banu Hashim first had been only the Banu Hashim now the whole Quraysh are coming to him as a representative of the Quraysh against the Banu Hashim. And this is the stepping stone because the next step is going to be the boycott. We'll come to that inshallah next week or the two weeks from now. But for now, they come to him and they say to him, Okay, look, we heard you tried. We understand he's your nephew. We have a proposition to make. We have chosen the most noble of all of the people of Mecca. The most noble young man. And this is the son of Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, we're going to come to him in a while. He's one of the leaders of one of the other tribes of the Quraysh. Just like Abu Talib is one of the leaders, Al-Walid is, is one of the leaders of the Banu Maghzum. Okay, so it is his peer. Al-Walid is the peer, he's the same level as Abu Talib. Here is the son of Al-Walid, Al-Umara ibn Walid. And one son for one son. will hand over... Al-Umara to you. And he will become yours. We'll give him your, basically you adopt him. Okay? He will become your son. And in return you hand over your son or your nephew to us and we do as we please. At this the, Abu Talib became extremely angry. And he said, what an evil bargain or what a, what a foolish transaction. What a, yani, what a aswa, what an what a evil bargain that you're saying. You want me to take care of one of your own so that I fatten him with my food while you take my son and you kill him? What a foolish bargain is this? I take care of yours and you will go and kill mine? And this Jubair ibn Mut'im, and again Jubair ibn Mut'im is, at this point in time, Jubair is the eldest person alive in Quraysh. And he is considered to be as close to a ruler as possible. And our Prophet has many a hadith about Jubair. He never converted. His son, uh, 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 sorry, Mut'am ibn Adi, I'm saying. Uh, Jubair ibn Mut'am ibn Adi. So Mut'am ibn Adi uh, stood up and he said to Abu Talib, he said, O oh Abu Talib, I think that your people have done as much as they humanly can. You need to accept one of these offers now. And this was now basically the whole of Mecca united against Abu Talib, single-handedly. This is the senior most person who is the most reserved. He was the one, by the way, backtrack. He was the one who prevented bloodshed when the Kaaba was being rebuilt. And he was the one who suggested the first man to come in. He's going to be the one who decides, the black stone. This is that person, right? He was the one who, again, so many stories about him. This is that senior most person. He has the most sense. He's the least hostile to anybody, right? For him to take sides, this is a big deal. And he says to Abu Talib that, Oh, Abu Talib, your people have done as much as is reasonably expected. What more do you expect them to do? They've given you all of these options. What more do you expect them to do? So, Mut'im ibn Adi, it's not Jubayr, sorry, Jubayr was the Sahabi. His father is Mut'im. So, Jubayr ibn Mut'im became a Muslim. In the Battle of Badr, we'll read his story. This is Mut'im ibn Adi. This is the, 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 the senior one. And by the way, Mut'im ibn Adi, uh, the Prophet said about him, Mut'im, the father, this one. The Prophet said about him, in the Battle of Badr, that Mut'im had died after the Hijrah by a little while, so he never saw the Battle of Badr. He said, when the Prophet saw all of the prisoners of Badr, 72 prisoners with their hands bound and they're wondering what's going to happen, are they going to be executed, are they going to be ransomed, they don't know what's going to happen. The Prophet said one of the highest praises he ever said for any pagan, and he said it for Mut'im ibn Adi. He said, if Mut'im ibn Adi were alive right now, 
and he said to me one word about these 72 prisoners, that he wanted them back, I would have freed them all for his sake. That is praise. That is praise for Mutab ibn Hadi. Why did the Prophet praise him so much? We'll talk about. This incident doesn't seem that nice because he's siding against him, right? But this was maybe the worst thing Mutam ever did. Later on, for the next 10 years or the next 6 years, we'll see Mutam doing a lot of positive for the Muslims. A lot of positives. And because of those positives, the Prophet praised him. And this shows us very clearly that not all kafirs are the same. There are some kafirs that are very good. They have genuine hearts and they help Islam. And the Prophet praised them and took advantage of that. And there are others who are evil to the core. And the Prophet cursed them and despised them. You don't treat all non-Muslims the same. And this is a very narrow-minded that some of us have. That some of us think that our religion preaches this. No, our religion does not preach that we hate all kuffar. Our religion does not preach that all kuffar are filthy and dirty. No, some of them are very noble. And some of them are very ignoble. Some of them are very righteous and good in their affairs with us. Even if they have kufr in their private lives and they worship other than Allah, their characters are good. In their mu'amala with us. In their standing up, let's say, for human rights, for civil rights. Right? In our times, you have many non-Muslims who bend over backwards when they see Muslims being discriminated against. And they do more for the community than many Muslims do. These are the Mutab ibn Adis of our time. And we should help them and praise them like the Prophet and praised Mut'im ibn Adi. In this case, however, Mut'im, this is in the beginning of Islam, he seems to take a stance that is not that praiseworthy. Later on, he'll redeem himself partially. He never accepted Islam. So Mut'im says to Abu Talib, like I said, that, O oh Abu Talib, your people have done as much as is reasonable to be expected in this situation. Take one of these options and now come on, move on. Either give him over to us or stop him or take this young lad. What else do you want them to do? And this was literally, you can say, Abu Talib versus all of the people of Mecca. And it is a very precarious situation because you don't know what's going to happen now. The next stage will basically be one of two things. And that is that they, most likely, what would have happened, uh, if Allah had not willed otherwise, they would have told Abu Talib, you are no longer the leader of the Banu Hashim. And this would have been the first time in the history of the Arabs that a tribal leader had been replaced while he's still alive and healthy and mentally capable. Never before had they, this is a coup d'etat. Right, basically in our vernacular, this is a coup d'etat. You get rid of the ruler and replace him. This is unheard of in the arrows because how can you have a coup against your own uncle or your own grandfather? This is what a tribal leader is. It's not some stranger. This is your blood relative, your senior most blood relative. It's unheard of in their tribal system. And so Abu Talib takes on a bravery that is wallahi unbelievable to confront every one of his tribesmen in the whole of Quraysh. And he says to, to, to Mut'im directly, O oh Mut'im, this is a plot that you have hatched. To stand up at this time and to publicly take sides, you had this plan from before. He sees through the plot basically, right? This is a staged event. You have a script that you have and you're playing the script now. And then he says and he threatens them, do as you please, I am not going to budge from my position. And this is what you call genuine bravery. Because Abu Talib had no support whatsoever. Not one person to physically stand up and fight with him. It was literally his honor and prestige versus the whole of Quraysh. And he literally put it at their hands because he told them, I can't do anything. Do what you please, I'm not going to budge. You want to kill me along with him? Fine, I'm not going to budge. And he also wrote some poetry, and by the way, a point of uh, a note here for the uh, uh, lovers of poetry, the era, uh, classical poetry. You all know that there are famous poets in this time, the Mu'allaqat al Sab'a, and all of this is of this era. The seven most famous Arabic poems were of the era of the Quran being revealed, and Allah revealed the Quran uh, in a language that was far more powerful than the seven hanging poems they're called. Abu Talib was one of the most famous poets of the Quraysh. And his poetry is absolutely phenomenal. And Ibn Hajar and many others comment and they say that in fact Abu Talib's poetry is 
more profound and more beautiful than the seven poems that were hung in the Kaaba. And if you read his poetry, which is recorded in many books, in Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham, and in the Tabaqat of Ibn Sa'ad, you find it is a very powerful with message. And at this occasion, he composed a series of poems chastising his own relatives and accusing them of being traitors to their own way of life. That you are not respecting the sanctity of your own relatives. And Allah Azza wa Jal willed that the Quraysh back down. Even though he had no power on his side. Not one man to stand up. But it was that sense of dignity and that sense of sincerity. That I am not going to budge and be inhumane. That you kill your own relative and my nephew. I am not going to let you do this. And the strength of his convictions won the day by the blessings of Allah Azza wa That's all it was. Because nothing else would have saved him. He didn't have anything else. And in this one incident, we open up a window to see the wisdom of the whole phenomenon of Abu Talib. What do I mean by the phenomenon of Abu Talib? The Prophet did not love anybody more than he loved Abu Talib. This is his father and mother in one. He didn't have a father and mother growing up. This is his grandfather's son. This is everybody to him. And yet, Abu Talib did not convert to Islam. And when the Prophet ﷺ begged and pleaded with him, even on his deathbed, when he's about to die, the Prophet ﷺ is 53 years old. Imagine, my dear brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ had this figure in his life till he was 53 years old. Many of us, we don't have our parents at a young age. He had this f uncle, if you like, a father figure, till he's 53 and his, f his uncle is there with him. What a relationship he has. And now he's on his deathbed and he's about to die and he comes and he begs with him, Ya Am! قُلْ كَلِمَةً أُحَاجُّكَ بِهَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ I beg you, say one kalima, and I will be able to argue in front of Allah to save you. Just say one kalima, and I'll be able to argue in front of Allah to save you. And Abu Talib was about to say it. Because in his heart, actually Abu Talib knew that this religion is true. He had seen too many signs, he'd seen too many miracles, and most importantly, he knew who his nephew was. And he knew his nephew couldn't tell a lie. But there was one thing that was more precious to him than his nephew, and that was his father. And that was the lineage, the prestige. You are the son of Abdul Muttalib. You are the inheritor of the legacy of Abdul Muttalib. That prestige of Nasab, of lineage, which was everything for the Arabs, right? For the Arabs, that was everything. The Quraysh at that time, for the, uh, the Arab tribes, everything was who your father was. And he happened to be the son of the most famous Arab of the previous generation. And we already said that a person's legacy pinnacles around 40, 50 years after his death, right? We said this many weeks ago, that the legends grow after a person's death, just like in our times, JFK, for example, is actually more admired than when he was when he died. During his presidency, JFK had a lot of negatives about him and a lot of things. And now MLK as well, Martin Luther King, when he was alive, scandals, this and that. Now, look at his legacy. It's human nature. You kind of aggrandize the people of the past. So Abdul Muttalib reaches his pinnacle of legacy. Right? And now this is Abu Talib, the son of this giant. Mythical giant. This is his son. And so one thing is more precious to him than the truth and that is his lineage. And he's just about to say the kalima, and Abu Jahl is standing there. The people of the Quraysh surrounding him, and the Prophet is begging him to say the kalima, and Abu Jahl sees his mouth open, he gets scared. Because if you convert, we're in trouble now. And so he says to Abu Talib, Are you going to leave the religion of your father? The father. Are you? He didn't even say really paganism. No, the religion of your father, the way of your father. And that caused his mouth to close, and that's when the Malik al-Mawt came and took his ruh, and he did not say the kalima. But our Prophet was so emotionally moved. This is his uncle and his father figure. He said, I will ask Allah to forgive you, even if I don't have permission. Because realize, for the Prophets, all the Prophets, you need permission to take a step. 
Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do what he did to uh, 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 Yunus? Why did Allah Azza wa do to what he did to Yunus? Because Yunus left his people without permission. Yunus left his people without permission. And you cannot do anything as a prophet without permission from Allah. You need permission. Because you are a prophet, you're representing the message of Allah, the Sharia of Allah. And so the Prophet ﷺ would not do anything unless Allah told him to do it. In this case, his emotions were so powerful, he said, I will ask Allah to forgive you unless Allah stops me. I, I'm not going to ask permission, I'm going to ask Allah to forgive you. And he continued to ask forgiveness until Allah revealed multiple verses in the Quran. Of them is Surah At-Tawbah. مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِي وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرُوا لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ وَلَوْ كَانُوا أُولِي قُرْبَى It is not befitting for the Prophet and the believers to seek forgiveness for pagans, even if they're close relatives. You shouldn't do that. And of them is Surah Al-Shu'ara, Surah Al-Qasas, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَعَ You are not able to guide those whom you love. But Allah guides those whom He pleases. Now this is what I meant by the phenomenon of Abu Talib. Why? 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 This is Rasulullah And this is the most beloved person to him. The one whom he loves like no one else. So much so that many years later in the conquest of Mecca, when Abu Bakr comes to the Prophet with his own father, Abu Qahafa, being carried by the people, and his beard is completely white. And Abu Qahafa is a pagan and an enemy of Islam. And when the Mecca is conquered, finally for the first time, Abu Qahafa accepts Islam as an old man of 80 years old. And Abu Qahafa holds on to the hand of the Prophet and says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu annaka Rasulullah. Abu Bakr begins to cry. And he says, Wallahi ya Rasulullah, what I would give even my father's hand if I could see the hand of Abu Talib in your hand to accept Islam. He would even give up his own father's Islam because he wanted the Islam of Abu Talib. This is the father figure of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What I would give, even my father's hand I would give it up if I could see the hand of Abu Talib in your hand. He knew how much he loved Abu Talib, he knew it. And so he said, even this I would give up, Ya Rasulullah. How I wanted to see Abu Talib hand in your hand. This is how much he loved him and yet Allah did not. Why? What is the wisdom? Here we see the wisdom. We see the wisdom because the one person who could have physically protected him had to remain a pagan. He had to remain a pagan. Because if he converted, what would have happened? What would have happened? Immediately he would have lost the leadership. He would have lost the status. He would have lost the protection he could have offered. And so Allah knows best. Allah knows better even than Rasulullah You don't know and I know. You needed Abu Talib. You needed him to do what happened to you. And so Abu Talib remained who he remained because that was his one claim to fame. That was his one claim to power. You are the son of Abdul Muttalib. How can we oppose you? And because of that power, the Prophet ﷺ could preach as he preached. It was only after the death of Abu Talib, when Abu Lahab took charge, that the Prophet ﷺ had to leave Mecca and go to Medina. He couldn't, he was going to be killed. It was only after that. And he had to be who he had to be, Abu Talib, I mean. He could not convert. And also, of course, there is also the wisdom here that is clearly, that Allah mentions in the Quran, clearly the wisdom of Nobody can dictate to Allah what Allah wants to do. Not even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in this is a clear indication that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even if he's the greatest human being, he is not God, he is not a demigod, he is not the son of a god, he is a human being. He does not control the lives of other people, including his own uncle. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ You cannot guide somebody just because you want to guide Rasulullah. Only Allah guides somebody whom he wants to guide. Even Rasulullah as he said in this first khutbah to his own daughter Fatima, I cannot protect you from the fire of hell. 
It's not mine to do so. And this clearly shows there are many Muslim groups out there that have taken this love of Rasulullah to an extreme level and they make him out to be literally a god or a demigod. And in his own lifetime, we see he couldn't protect his own uncle because Allah had a higher wisdom than him. And notice as well, and with this inshallah ta'ala we will conclude for this week. Notice as well the example of four uncles of the Prophet each one of whom occupies such a different level. Lineage means nothing in Islam. It is your own actions. Four uncles, all of them children of Abdul Muttalib, all of them direct uncles of Rasulullah and all of them have places different from one another. The highest of them, Hamza, Sayyidu Shuhada. No one of the Shuhada occupies a higher level than him. Hamza, the Sayyid of the Shuhada. And then there is Abbas, who is one of the great Muslims, but he cannot be compared to Hamza or even of the ten elite. He is a Muslim and he converted later on and he was not of that level of the ten elite and he was of the righteous. And this is Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the father of Abdullah ibn Abbas. So these two are Muslims, the one at the height of the ranks, the other, alhamdulillah, at a good level, but not at that level as some of the higher. And then you have two who did not convert to Islam. You had Abu Talib and you had Abu Lahab. As for Abu Talib, then he is the highest person ever amongst the non-Muslims in the history of our religion. No one occupies a rank higher than Abu Talib, even though he's still not a Muslim. And Al-Abbas asked the Prophet ﷺ, hadith is in Sahih Muslim, Al-Abbas asked the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, your uncle, he benefited you so much, weren't you able to benefit him back? Listen to this hadith. His own brother is saying that my brother helped you so much. Couldn't you help him a little bit back? And the Prophet said, yes, I did. I did. Because of my dua for him, that Allah allowed me to make one dua for him, Abu Talib has been removed to one of the outlying perimeters of the fire of hell. And were it not for my dua, he would be in the pits and the depth of the fire of hell. In another version, we read that Abu Talib has the least punishment out of all of the people of Jahannam. No one in Jahannam is being punished lesser than Abu Talib. No one. And this shows us the benefits that the Prophet did manage by the permission of Allah to bring about for what he has done. The least person being punished. But he didn't get to Jannah because he's an idol worshipper. And Allah will not forgive the sin of shirk. And this is the highest of the kafirs ever. And then you have the opposite extreme and that is Abu Lahab. For whom Allah revealed a surah that we recite in the Quran that curses him till the day of judgment. The, the one person who is cursed by name in the Quran. We already mentioned Zayd is blessed in the Quran, mentioned by name. Abu Bakr is indirectly referenced. The one enemy of Islam who is mentioned by name. There is no other name amongst those enemies of Islam of that time. There are indirect references. Yes, indirect. Many references to, to people without name. But the one reference by name to the enemy of Islam is the uncle of the Prophet Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tabba ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma kasab sayasla naran thata lahab wa mra'atuhu hammalat al-hatab fi jidiha hablun min masad we recite the surah till the day of judgment invoking the curse of Allah upon him for what he had done. These are four brothers. And every one of them occupies such a different level, even though they're all sons of the same father, and they're all uncles of the greatest human being who ever walked the face of this earth. All of this to show us, my dear brothers and sisters, your fathers and your children will not help you on the day of judgment. It is what you have done, it is what I have done, it is what each and every one of us have done in this world. And that was the basic message, the first message, the first khutbah that our Prophet gave in public, and that is, you need to save yourselves. Nobody is going to help you. You need to live righteous lives. I cannot help you. Nobody can help you against the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, we will continue with the ta'ala next week. Wa akhir da'wan. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam. Barakah wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. We have six minutes, inshallah, for questions. Yes. I have one off-topic question for you. Um, well, Two weeks back, I think you gave a presentation uh, at FedEx about Islam and uh, 
show you. Show you. And just to tell us a little bit about uh, that experience, and one or two tough questions that you got and who responded, <coughs> and we can all benefit from that. It's, it's an interesting topic, you know. It's not directly relevant to the class. Um, inshallah, we'll just do two minutes of this, then we'll try to get back to the class. Uh, last week, uh, <coughs> the, uh, mashallah, the brothers at uh, FedEx invited me to give a presentation to the workers there, the, the people there, where everything runs on time, I heard, mashallah, at FedEx. Uh, and it was a, ca a call, basically, uh, you know, the, what is the Sharia? Is it something to be scared of or something to be uh, worried about? And uh, I gave a short presentation there, and alhamdulillah there was a good turnout there, and there were some very uh, tough and very specific questions, and that's fine. I always welcome such tough questions. It's better that they ask me than they ask somebody else. Um, so uh, you wanted to know one of the tough questions. <laughs> um, well, there was one lady there who definitely had done some research. She was clear, or she had been misinformed or whatnot, right? So. When I said, for example, that yes, there are elements of the Sharia, ah, so obviously the question is always about cutting off of the hands and the stoning of the adulterer, this and that, and all these questions of the Sharia ah, about, you know, this is a part of the Sharia. Ah. You all know me that I am not a progressive. I don't think we should get away with this. I am not somebody who wants to reform Islam inside out. Uh, I believe in our tradition and I am a firm follower of the Sharia ah, as it was revealed to the Prophet At the same time, I'm pragmatic and realistic and I try to be uh, a part of the modern world. And so, when I said, for example, that yes, our Sharia ah did have these laws, and this is how it was for many centuries, that the thief's hand would be cut off and this would happen. But we as American Muslims, we're not asking for this to be implemented as law of the land. And it is true, I'm not asking for the constitution to be changed and the sharia to be instituted. We understand that we're a minority, we understand that we have to obey the laws of the land. We're not asking for a revolution at all. We said, that, said this very clearly. So she had done her research or she had been told this, so she goes, how can you believe in the sharia and not want to cause a revolution? and bring about a change in the laws. If you're faithful to your religion, because the, the, what they have been told, right, what Islamophobes tell them, is that every Muslim desires to overthrow the law and to institute uh, the Sharia, right? Or else they're hypocrites to their religion. So she's basically getting this from her sources, then she's throwing it back at me. How can you believe in the Sharia ah and not want to cause a revolution? How can I trust you, basically, in this regard? Uh, and this is a very frank question. It's a very, and I'm happy she asked it. I welcome any difficult question, uh, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, and so I said to her, because we have precedent in our religion, our religion allows for this. Our religion allows for this. Our religion clearly allows that we live as a minority peacefully in a land without causing any harm to the majority, not wanting to overthrow the majority and the status quo. And the example of this is the Muslims of Abyssinia, which we're going to come to in two weeks from now, inshallah ta'ala. The Muslims of Abyssinia provide a role model framework for us as Muslims in America. And I have to be very frank here, brothers and sisters, there are many Islamic movements in the Eastern world whose goal is to establish a Khilafah, right? I am not talking about them at all in the Eastern world. I will talk about them in the West. And I will say any movement that has as its goal to establish a Khilafah should not be doing so in the Western world. This is naive, this is political suicide, and this is un-Islamic even. You cannot live as a minority in a majority land, and your goal is to overthrow the majority. This is foolish. You are deluding yourself. Neither does our religion allow us to be double-faced. We have to be very clear here. Our religion does not allow us. That's why I don't like the word secret da'wah. I don't like it. The da'wah is private, not secret. We are not allowed to in the masjid preach quietly, guys, we're going to want a revolution. And then public we say, oh guys, we're peaceful citizens. No, our message is the same. What we say in public, we say in the masjid. What we say in the masjid, we say in public. If we believe otherwise, we should leave somewhere else and not live here. This is my message to every Muslim. If you genuinely believe that you're not allowed to be a law-abiding citizen, then don't be a law-abiding citizen, go somewhere else. But don't be treacherous, and don't live a double face, because that's going to cause harm to you and to us. So I told the lady that we have a precedence in our religion. I'm not criticizing the Sharia 
uh, uh, where it exists. I'm not criticizing uh, the cutting off of the hand, you know, Islamically. I would seek Allah's refuge. It's a verse in the Quran. What do you want me to say to that? A'udhu billah from any Muslim saying this is jahiliyyah, it's backward. Allah says in the Quran that when you f catch the thief, then you cut off his hand. How can I criticize that, you know, anywhere in the world? But I am saying, you asking me this question is irrelevant because I'm not asking for it to be implemented here. I'm not asking for it to be implemented in America. We have the precedence in our religion of Muslims immigrating to Abyssinia, thousands, hundreds of them, not thousands, hundreds of them, and their condition to the Negus and the Negus condition to them was basically what we are, and that is, you let us be Muslims and we'll be a part of your society and be peaceful citizens, right? You don't interfere in our religion. We're not in going to interfere, you know, in, the, in, in, in overthrowing the, 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 the laws of the land. The Muslims of Abyssinia did not plot and plan to overthrow the Najashi. The Muslims of Abyssinia were not planning to take over uh, Najashi, right? Even when Najashi died and the next ruler came, they lived, they, they lived their lives until finally the Prophet called them back to Medina in the seventh year of the Hijrah. And this provides a working role model for us. It's not exactly the same, there are differences, but overall there's a working role model, and that is that we're allowed to live as minorities in a non-Muslim land, and we respect the laws of the land, and they in return should give us the freedom to be Muslims. If they don't give us the freedom to be Muslims, then we go and find somewhere else to live. We don't have the right to be treacherous. This is not a part of our religion. We're never allowed to be treacherous. Never. Khiyana is never allowed in Islam. And that is to promise somebody something and say, yes, I promise to be a law-abiding citizen. And then you go and you bomb and you plot. No. If you don't, want to do, if you don't promise them, go, do, go somewhere else in the world, I'm saying. Right? Don't, and you want to curse and preach against the country? Go and do it somewhere else. But don't be a part of the society and give your land and your oath and your, and your uh, you know, visa and your passport. And then in your heart and in your speech, you are a traitor. That's not our religion. That's not our religion. And so I said, we have precedence in this regard. And when I told her this, you couldn't respond to that. But I mean, alhamdulillah, I mean, I firmly believe we do not have a problem Islamically to be a part of this country. Yes, there are issues we're angry about, and we resolve them in a legitimate manner. And that's my da'wah is always about this, inshallah. <laughs> Going through the happy means, the middle, inshallah ta'ala. One, one question about the topic, so that we get to the topic. Yes. Is it true that uh, Abu Lahab is given two drops of water every Monday? And because he feeds slaves on the location of Rasulullah The question is, is it true that Abu Lahab receives two drops of water every Monday? Because he freed two slaves when the Prophet was born. There is a hadith in a tabarani that mentions this, and it is inshallah an authentic hadith. And therefore, uh, even Abu Lahab uh, receives something which is minuscule, but it is still nonetheless symbolic. And that is that he gets two drops of water, two drops of water uh, for having shown happiness at the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Where does this narration come from? Uh, I can look it up for you, but it's in Tabarani. But I can look it up for you exactly and give it to you, but it is in Tabarani. Al-Mu'jam al-Kabir, inshaAllah. Uh, with this, inshaAllah, we, uh, we need to conclude for Maghrib, inshaAllah.